Now I'd like to talk about some methods for measuring primary productivity. And methods talks and discussions of methods can sometimes seem very technical and perhaps why are we learning this kind of thing, but I think it'll help you get some understanding of the history of the measurement of primary productivity in the ocean. It will also give you some background for some of the things you might be doing in some of your laboratory classes in oceanography. And it's also one of the things that I helped develop as a graduate student uh, at U USC. So I'm going to talk about it because, well, this is my lecture. So let's go. One of the most common methods and one of the original methods for measuring the amount of phytoplankton and really plankton in the ocean was through use of a plankton net. And this is a plankton net unlike any I have ever seen in my life. Uh, it's longer than any plankton net I've ever used in my life, but perhaps some of you have seen a plankton net in one of your laboratory classes. In any case, it's nothing more than a type of cloth with uh, a regular, regular space pores in it. Uh, you might think of it as cheesecloth, though it's not as cheesy as cheesecloth. And this net is simply strained through the water and the organisms are collected down here in the collecting bucket called the caught end of the plankton net. And they're strained from the water. And if we keep track of how much water is being, uh, that goes through the net by noting how long that we've towed it or how deep that we've towed it, we can get some rough estimate of how much plankton there are in the water at any particular time. If we do this comparatively, maybe even in the morning and at night, we can get perhaps some idea of the growth rates of those organisms, or if we do it on a seasonal basis and those kinds of things. But for the most part, plankton nets are generally too large of a mesh size for the kinds of phytoplankton uh, that we're mostly interested in, uh, and certainly too small for the cyanobacteria, which make up the bulk of it. But historically, they've been a very important tool, albeit a very simple one, for measuring the concentration and abundance of plankton in the ocean. In fact, you can make your own plankton net if you have a pair of nylon stockings, and hopefully they're not this big, and a embroidery hoop, you can attach those stockings to that pair of nylons to an embroidery hoop, put a baby food jar in the end, and you have your own plankton net. You're in business. You can go into business as an oceanographer studying plankton, the way oceanographers did on the Challenger expedition and the U.S. exploring ocean, uh, expedition, and even the way modern oceanographers do aboard NOAA vessels, or uh, which I believe this vessel is. This is an example of a more sophisticated plankton net, and probably really plankton nets, as I said before, are really more useful for zooplankton than they are for phytoplankton. Here we have what's called a bongo net. It's called a bongo net because it's two nets side by side, just like a bongo. And this net allows us to get some understanding of the variability. Now you wouldn't think that from one net to the other it would be very variable, but one thing we know about plankton is they're very patchy. They're not homogeneous in their distributions in the ocean. So by pulling two nets side by side, we get some estimate of the natural variability that occurs even within a sample. And that allows us to better compare plankton toes from different locations. This is a picture taken up uh, off Banfield uh, at Banfield Marine Station on Vancouver Island in Canada. Uh, and this happened to be a beautiful day, but look how green this water is, really productive kinds of waters. Now, once you get those plankton samples, they generally require and at least in the olden days and if in certain kinds of things that you want to know, if you want to know what's in it, you got to look through a microscope. This is not Professor Chamberlain, I assure you. But I did spend a couple of years as an undergraduate work-study student at the University of Washington in my junior and senior years, counting phytoplankton underneath an inverted microscope. And it was that experience that really made me understand in, in ways that are perhaps even somewhat subliminal, but staring through a microscope, counting phytoplankton, gives you an understanding of the ocean in a way that other kinds of things can't. When you actually see the organisms, the, the tiny little phytoplankton, and see the changes in their abundance from location to location or from season to season, when you see something like a coccolithid flora bloom right before your eyes, 
it makes you think about the ocean. And microscope work is very tedious, and I don't really recommend it to anybody, but I, I do say if you get a chance to look at a microscope and spend a few hours looking at plankton, it really will open your eyes to a, an entirely different world, and in fact a world that makes our world go around and really makes our world possible. So the phytoplankton deserve it for you to spend a few hours taking a close look at them underneath a microscope. Well, one of the net results of counting phytoplankton in the early days, in the late 1800s, was putting together a list of the variations in plankton abundance through the annual cycle. And this is a what's called a calendar of the plankton um, in a book by John Stone, produced in 1908. And here we see the months of the year, and these black lines indicate when certain kinds of plankton were found. For example, the Nopliae, or the, the little larvae of copepods that I emphasized so much in chapter 12, can be found in January, February, March, April, and May. Diatoms are mostly only abundant in March and April. Crab larvae we find in June, July, August, September, October, November. So these are the t times of year that we expect to find certain kinds of plankton. And one of the goals of putting together this kind of calendar of the plankton was to use it as a way of predicting what kinds of fish that we might see and how abundant those fish might be. Early oceanographic efforts really uh, in the applied sense were about trying to figure out how productive the oceans were in terms of their fisheries. And in order to understand fisheries, we have to understand the plankton. So these really Herculean efforts to uh, look at plankton and put together their abundances throughout the year were really designed to and with an effort towards understanding fisheries productivity here, in this case, off the coast of West England. Now, one of my students asked me why there's nothing in December. And I honestly don't have an answer for that. It could be that they didn't take measurements in December. It's highly unlikely that nothing was living in December. But unfortunately, Mr. Johnstone is no, no longer with us, having published this in 1908. But if you happen to know the answer to that, please email me. I'd like to know.